So good morning, 23 years and three months ago, the Guy family walked into this congregation for the very first time. Annika was exactly four months old. Christy was five-ish, almost (laughs) about five, just starting kindergarten. It's been an interesting 23 years, <laughs> and uh, I'm not quite sure I ever quite imagined 23 years ago that today Annika and I would be leading you in a sermon time, a teaching time today. Teaching time. <laughs> but here we are. Amen. So those of you who have small children... Sherman family, Larios, others, um, you have much to look forward to. So one of our goals today with our presentation is to reignite an excitement in all of us about the Bible. We hope that your Advent season in the year 2020 will involve a new relationship with Scripture. And we'll do that in part today by looking at Esther from different perspectives, ones that might be novel to us, perhaps even, maybe, possibly a little bit disconcerting. And our suggestion for us all is that if that's the way you feel at any point this morning, read more scripture. Maybe the discomfort you feel or the excitement you feel will be explained and your soul will be refreshed by what you find there. So we're going to start with the question of where does Esther fit into the biblical framework? First slide, please. In the Christian Bible, it's in the Old Testament, essentially the Hebrew scriptures, covering the time period from creation to a few hundred years before the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, and focused on the experiences of God's people through thick and thin. Next slide. In our modern Bibles, the Testaments are internally organized as well, partly by time and partly by topic, although the divisions are rarely included, which is rather unfortunate, actually, as the Old Testament is often viewed as having five major sections, the law, or the books of Moses, or Torah, as it's called, history, wisdom literature, and major and minor prophets. Notice that in this organization, Esther is the last of the history books, next slide, and adjacent to the wisdom literature ones. Note also that Daniel is at the end of the major prophets section. Both chronologically and perhaps more importantly, topically, these two books are arguably misplaced. Next slide. A correct chronological order would have Daniel and Esther before Ezra and Nehemiah, as both stories occur before the post-exilic efforts of Ezra and Nehemiah to restore the temple and society in Jerusalem. Now, Daniel's story spans from King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon conquering Israel and Judah into the reigns of Cyrus and Darius, where the Medes and Persians in turn conquered Babylon. The king and Esther's story is a bit unclear. Scholars have disputed whether the Ahasuerus of Esther is Xerxes I, Xerxes II, maybe even Xerxes III. But in any case, Esther's story is set about 100 years after the invasion of Babylon. So many Jews had been in exile for three, five generations or more, and the restoration of Jerusalem was in the distant future and not on anybody's radar. This morning, Annika and I are going to suggest, among other things, that Esther may belong more in the wisdom literature section than in the history section. Next slide. So we all know the story of Esther, or do we? Next slide. Take the names of the four key characters, the king, Mordecai, Esther, and Haman. Ahasuerus appears to be a play on Xerxes, a Persian royal dynasty, done this way to avoid pinning down a particular claim. King, next slide. 
Mordecai, a Jew, has a Persian name derived from Marduk. Who's Marduk? He's the patron god of Babylon. Now, granted, that didn't work out very well, but that's still his name. Esther, also a Jew, has a Persian name honoring who? The ancient Sumerian goddess of love and war. Haman's name is derived from the ancestral connection to a king of the Amalekites, who, if you remember all of the ites from back in the Canaan days, were mortal enemies of the children of Israel over and over and over again for nearly a thousand years. So here we have three of the four key palace characters that are foreigners in amazingly powerful positions. But have I heard this story before? Yeah, um, Joseph. And after Joseph, um, Moses. And after Moses, and not long before Esther, Daniel, another foreigner, very powerful in the land. Back to the storyline, which is largely set in the royal palace in the capital of Persia. Near the end of a series of banquets, the Persian king banishes his queen for disobedience, conducts a search for a new wife, chooses a Jewish woman named Esther. Although, as we pointed out earlier in the children's story, he doesn't know she's Jewish. Esther's uncle or cousin Mordecai, who raised her, visits her regularly during her time at the palace. A number of other interesting things happen, including Mordecai overhearing a plot to kill the king. He passed it to Esther. Esther told the king about it. Um, but the biggest story shift occurs when Haman convinces the king to write a decree allowing for the genocide of the Jewish population in Persia. Mordecai urges Esther to entreat the king on behalf of her people, but she says he hasn't summoned her and she'll be killed if she goes uninvited. So Mordecai tells her if she doesn't save her people, someone else will, but she won't be spared. So Esther goes to the king, he doesn't kill her. She holds two banquets before finally asking him to spare her people. In between the back-to-back -back dinners, the king remembers Mordecai saving him from the plot to kill him and has him honored, much to Haman's distress. And when Esther reveals her Jewish heritage to the king, he orders the execution of Haman and makes Mordecai his chief of staff instead. The king can't really repeal his genocidal decree, so he writes a new one that allows the Jews to fight back. They do, they kill a lot of people, and a rather satisfying revenge narrative. Esther and Mordecai decree that this triumph will be celebrated every year in the future by Jews as the festival of Purim. And they all lived happily ever after. So that's the book of Esther. <laughs> <laughs> we all, I think, have heard the story in some form over the years. It's a pretty familiar one. Um, Christians often talk about it as, or view it as a kind of historical account of God saving his chosen people from genocide. It's a little more complicated than that in terms of um, biblical history, textual history. Um, for one thing, God isn't mentioned in the book at all. It's one of actually only two books in the Hebrew Bible that don't mention God. Um, the other one is Song of Songs. So there's that. Um, the bigger wrench, perhaps, is that scholars largely agree that Esther is probably not a historical account. Uh, there are pieces of it that are historically accurate. So the writer clearly was familiar with Persian customs. They were familiar with the workings of the Persian court. All of those things are reasonably accurate. The details around the, like the feast scenes are pretty consistent uh, historically. Um, there's no, unfortunately, extra biblical evidence of Persia ever having had a Jewish queen. Um, Xerxes I, who's most commonly identified as the king in Esther, um, had, one queen, had one queen for pretty much all of his reign, and she was present into her son's reign. <laughs> so she was not the divorced queen. Um, and some people have attempted to say that she was Esther, 
but we know who her father was, and he was a Persian, either general or member of the court, um, not Abihail, who is Esther's father in the text. And so there have been some other attempts to identify various Persian kings, Artaxerxes, plural, there's multiple of them, <laughs> um, and I think a, a, like a Cyaxerxes kind of a name jumps in there somewhere. Um, they're also kind of a reach. Um, we also know, and this is probably one of the bigger problems for the plot, we know that Persia was very tolerant of minority ethnicities and their conquered peoples. It was a very big empire. It had a lot of conquered peoples. It was a very diverse empire, um, and they were very tolerant of the practices and languages of each individual region. This means that the, the idea of a king agreeing to a genocide of an entire subpopulation is not terribly plausible, um, based in part on the Cyrus Cylinder, which I think we have a picture of if you change the slide. Oops. Nope. <laughs> Back, maybe? I mean, maybe we lost the cylinder. The Cyrus Cylinder is a really cool nope. archaeological backwards, piece backwards. of history. Um, it's a cylinder that just has like, all kinds of there laws and go. things printed on it. Yeah, there it is. Super old, super cool. Um, OK, so <laughs> did you want to jump in? No. OK. Uh, so if it's not a historical account, um, what is Esther? Functionally, it's a couple things. First and perhaps most obviously, it's an ideology for Purim. So it's an explanation for a sort of justification for and an authorization of this really major Jewish holiday. Um, Purim is, I think, slide. Your Purim slide? Yeah. yeah cool. um, Purim is actually a really cool holiday. Um, my Jewish friend describes it as a combination of like Halloween and yay, they didn't kill us. Um, but it's a really fun holiday, um, very kind of carnivalesque almost. There's cookies and there's lots of games and lots of singing. Um, since many Jewish holy days emphasize atonement or mourning, uh, Purim stands out as a day of celebration. Um, Esther is also the only book of the Bible outside of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that lays out a major holiday in this way. So Esther is pretty unique. Um, in addition to explaining Purim, uh, the book of Esther also functions as a kind of national and cultural story. Um, it's a story about diaspora, or life outside of a homeland, and it was written, we assume, um, for and clearly about Jews living in diaspora during the Persian era. In that respect, uh, it's an imaginative tale of revenge and triumph for a people that have existed in diaspora and therefore been uniquely vulnerable for a massive portion of their history. Uh, in other words, it's a hopeful story about the odds for Jewish success and survival in a foreign land. That makes Esther a really deeply culturally and historically vital text in the Jewish tradition. It also puts it in really good company. Uh, Daniel, which my dad mentioned earlier, is another kind of story like that. Um, and the non-biblical books, Judith and Tobit, also tell similar diasporic stories. But while that answers the question of the importance of Esther to Jewish people, uh, and justifies its place in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, in that canon, it doesn't really tell us, right, what to do with the book as Christians. So if it's not a history, and it's not exactly a theology, at least not in a straightforward way, because again, it doesn't mention God, what do we as Christians do with it? Well, that's a big question, Mark. Nice of you to ask me that this morning. <laughs> and we're only proposing to partially answer that today. But we definitely are proposing that the book remains immensely valuable to us as Christians. It raises complex, fascinating questions that are worth considering and exploring. It's also important to note that the fact that Esther is a story doesn't remove its value. So stories, I think as we all know, perhaps innately or through experience, but maybe don't always think about, stories are hugely important to us as humans. Right? The stories we tell and the stories we read and listen to shape us as people, both individually and collectively. And they allow us to communicate across cultures and build empathy between people with vastly different lives. Stories also, at their core and at their best, express the human experience. Storytelling and story hearing is an intrinsic part of who we are as people, and we've been listening and telling stories for as long as we've existed. You know, getting back to the big question in part, yes, sir. 
Esther has been a source of continuing fascination for Christians through the centuries. This is evidenced by a remarkable pr presence in our Western culture. You know, there are more manuscript versions of Esther surviving from the medieval period than of any other biblical book. Next slide. It captured the attention of the painter Rembrandt not once but twice, who in turn influenced many other artists. The same Handel that wrote The Messiah also wrote an oratorio on Esther in 1718. Slide. Numerous other children's books. Yay. Slide. Videos. You remember this one? There you go. <laughs> remember that one? Steady stream of large and small screen productions. Even a print magazine. I have one here you probably have never thought about Esther as a superhero, have you? Maybe you Think should. about that, Esther as a superhero. All of this testifies to Esther's enduring influence on us today. First century rabbis might find this surprising as they themselves debated hotly regarding the inclusion of Esther or not in the Hebrew canon. The Essene sect appears to have avoided Esther entirely as it's the only Old Testament book completely absent from the Dead Sea Scrolls archive. Slide. Martin Luther openly doubted its inclusion in the Christian canon, but he was known to be a bit anti-Semitic and had little use for a God-free story. Of course, Esther, right, as a book of the Bible, is a part of one of the most influential texts in human history. Historically and culturally, that means it matters. And the Bible is also, in many ways, a living text, uh, by which I mean that it's reinterpreted with every new person that comes across it, and the way that we read and understand it changes regularly. That's a good thing. Um, and the fact that it has held up to those rereadings and reinterpretations speaks to its continued value and vitality uh, to us well over 2,000 years later. So Esther, as a, part of a Bible, as a part of the Bible, is in constant dialogue with us. We bring something new to the text whenever we read it, and it brings something to us as well. So what you're saying, I think, is that a reader's individual personal experience matters, and it influences how we read everything, including the Bible, and especially today, the story of Esther. As a baby boomer man who has spent his lifetime in university settings, I will necessarily read Esther differently than my daughter, a millennial who at this point has also spent her much shorter lifetime in academia and education, but she has formally studied English and religion. I've simply rubbed shoulders with theologians throughout my lifetime. Big difference there. This difference in experience, and thus interpretation, is to be celebrated and shared. My relationship with God and with others is and should be enhanced by listening to another's perspective. I think we should all be seeking out and hearing fellow Christians unlike us, rather than just like us. So I expect that I have much to learn from the richly diverse tapestry of backgrounds present in this church family today. So bringing, I guess, a literary perspective and a little bit of a historical, theological perspective to bear upon the book of Esther, um, it's been described at various times as a comedy, a satire, a parody, a burlesque, a fairy tale, and a drama. It's certainly a dramatic story, right? And it's a fun one. It has assassination attempts, court intrigue, <laughs> manipulations, <laughs> plot twists, and even some comedy. Aesthetically, um, it's extravagant and opulent, right, with extensive descriptions of the decorations and furnishings of the king's banquet. But you know, there wasn't a word there about the food, unless you account the explicit royal permission to drink to excess. So why are details about tablecloths and wallpaper more important than what was actually served and eaten? Yet another Esther story enigma. But back to the tale. We recall that the story opens with the king's opulent half-year festival and the wrap-up seven-day banquet. 
The drunk king sends for Queen Vashti, who's hosting her own seven-day banquet for the noble women. And he wants her to come clad in her royal crown and possibly little else to parade before the men at the king's banquet. She refuses. So if you read the story, you know this refusal has some consequences. <laughs> Um, If you want to turn with me in your Bibles to Esther chapter 1, verses 16 through 22, Um, I'm going to read that whole section. So the king has just asked his advisors what should be done to Queen Vashti for refusing to obey his command. And chapter 16, verse 16 starts, Thereupon Memucan declared in the presence of the king and the ministers... Queen Vashti has committed an offense not only against your majesty, but also against all the officials and against all the peoples in all the provinces of King Ahasuerus. For the queen's behavior will make all wives despise their husbands as they reflect that King Ahasuerus himself ordered Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day already, The ladies of Persia and Media, who have heard already of the queen's behavior, will cite it to all of your majesty's officials, and there will be no end of scorn and provocation. So if it please your majesty, let a royal edict be issued by you, and let it be written into the laws of Persia and Media, so that it cannot be abrogated, that Vashti shall never enter the presence of King Ahasuerus, and let your majesty bestow her royal state upon another who is more worthy than she." Then will the judgment executed by your majesty resound throughout your realm, vast though it is, and all wives will treat their husbands with respect, high and low alike. The proposal was approved by the king and the ministers, and the king did as Memucan proposed. Dispatches were sent to all the provinces of the king, to every province in its own script, and to every nation in its own language, that every man should wield authority in his home and speak the language of his own people. So. You, you don't look um, impressed, Annika. <laughs> yeah, so the consequence of Vashti's disobedience is apparently a complete and total marital anarchy across an entire empire, which I don't remember if we mentioned this before. Narratively, it extends... From India yeah, to, to Turkey, to, down to Ethiopia, throughout Egypt. Pretty large chunk the, of, This is the peak of the Persian Empire. It's enormous. So the entire empire, households are in uproar, marriage is falling apart, nobody knows what to do because the queen didn't appear, apparently. Um, This is part of the drama of the story, right? It pushes belief a little bit, a little bit. (laughs) Um, But I would say that the most important part of this, in addition to kind of just being a part of the, the atmosphere of the story, is that it sets up a clear consequence for womanly disobedience before we even meet Esther. And this is arguably Vashti's entire narrative function, right? This didn't have to be how she was removed from the text. The king's wife could have simply died, or he could have not had one. There's no reason, narratively, for Vashti to be there other than to set up the situation of disobedience and to establish the king as someone who's very not tolerant of disobedience. And so Vashti's entire narrative function is essentially to disobey and then disappear. But her mark, I would argue, lingers over the rest of the text and hangs over Esther's head as she steps into Vashti's shoes. Wow, that was chapter one. We've got nine chapters to go. Chapter two begins with the search for a new queen. Esther seems to have been suitably passive and obedient here, at least by the standards decreed in chapter one for women's behavior. She heeds Mordecai's instruction to hide her Jewishness and only takes what harem director Haggai chooses from the palace. The interview process with the king appears to involve an overnight tryout in the king's bedchamber. She does what she is told to do by the men in her life, even when that appears unseemly for a good Jewish girl. So should Esther have cooperated with this scheme? Did she even have a choice? 
unclear. <laughs> Uh, it's it's really not clear textually what say she had in the matter, and that it never explicitly states. We never see a point where Esther chooses to obey, debates obeying. She just goes where she goes. We don't even see her going so much as being moved around. Um, Rabbi Wendy M. Salem notes that Esther's movement through the story is marked, I think, three times by the Hebrew word lakash, which I definitely butchered the pronunciation of. Um, but it's most often translated as taken or brought. And a really quick and non-comprehensive concordance search suggests that the word is rarely, if ever, I didn't find any cases where the word is used between equals. Um, it's not a word that men routinely, men do not take men other places. They take wives in the story and people take inanimate objects. You know, they take their pots and things <laughs> various places. Um, the only times I found where the word lakash is applied to a man um, is in cases where God is taking, so like God takes Enoch to heaven, that's the same verb, um, or when a, a father or an uncle takes a younger male member of his family somewhere, such as, you know, I think Abraham taking Lot with him. Um, so it, it definitely implies a power imbalance and doesn't seem to suggest uh, any kind of conferral of autonomy upon the thing or person being taken. So all that is to say, really, that at least in the early parts of the Book of Esther, Esther doesn't go anywhere. Um, she's brought from place to place. She's moved around uh, by the men in her life. And so between that and the fact that, you know, in an, an ancient empire, it's sort of hard to imagine a young woman having the power or right to say no to a king, um, obedience was possibly her only real choice in so, so far. So my question now is, is Esther a model woman for the 21st century? I have here a Christian book that claims just that. Is obedience of Esther's type an ideal for women in the 21st century? Is Vashti then a cautionary tale to go along with the Esther obedience? What do you think? So to answer that, uh, we're going to look further ahead in the story. <laughs> so Esther becomes queen, um, is apparently a paragon of obedience and submission, which was possibly a real relief for Xerxes, who just fired his last wife for being disobedient. Um, there's a little Mordecai subplot involving saving the king, and then Mordecai refuses to bow to hangmen. Wait a minute. Another sense of deja vu here. Refusing to bow. Daniel and his friends. They had that problem, too. Yeah. Um, and like in Daniel, it has nearly fatal consequences here. Uh, but unlike in Daniel, where just the people who didn't bow are punished, uh, Haman seeks the genocide of all of the Jews. The king approves this, somewhat inexplicably. Um, and then the, the, the drama of the story continues um, with how Mordecai handles the information so the, the normal thing to do when you've just learned, I think, that your people are subject to a genocidal order might be to go to your cousin, the queen, and tell her about it. But he dons sackcloth and ashes first, which means he can't actually enter the palace gate. He is unsuitably attired. He's not allowed indoors. Um, Esther, this is why in the story, Esther tries to send him clothes, but he won't take them. <laughs> so he won't come to see her, even though she clearly wants to see him because she sent him clothes so that he could enter the palace. Uh, so instead, he sends a message through an intermediary. So now we're going to be doing some reading from Esther chapter 4, verses 7 through 17. So Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in the capital, to show to Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death, unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives but 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. 
Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this? Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I've heard that from two daughters so far this morning. This is a little concerning. <laughs> so Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. You know, it's interesting. The scene began with Mordecai telling Esther what to do. But it ends with Esther telling Mordecai what to do. More remarkably, he actually obeys her. He does what she tells him to do. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. The scene is actually really fascinating in that respect. So Mordecai's command, if you look at it closely, it puts Esther in a really difficult position. As a character who's so far been pretty exclusively obedient, she's now caught between obedience to two men, her father figure and her husband slash king. The threat of death is also implicit on both sides, right? On one side, the, the consequence for appearing before the king unsummoned is death. She says that very clearly. On the other side, Mordecai suggests that if she doesn't save her people, they will be saved some other way, but she will not be spared. While approaching the king has the, the potential reprieve, if he extends the scepter, which if we remove the hindsight of knowing that he does so in the story, um, that's not really a guarantee that Esther can count on, partly just because you can't, and also because we know that the last queen who disobeyed Ahasuerus was banished, and her actions spurred an empire-wide decree against wifely disobedience. So Esther knows, and we as readers know, that this king is particularly sensitive to wives disobeying him. He really doesn't like it. Uh, and that means that she can't count on his affection for her superseding the death sentence for appearing uninvited. So kind of looking lose-lose for Esther, isn't it? So what does she do? She fasts for three days. The Jews across the land fast for three days. And then, finally, she appears before the king. He welcomes her, good thing, but in a surprise move, Esther invites the king and Haman to a banquet. What's really interesting about this is that in doing this, Esther is mixing the Jewish and Persian playbooks, um, right? She fasts, very Jewish, and then she hosts a banquet, very Persian. Banquets are a quintessentially Persian feature of this book. Historically, we also know that was true. The Persian Empire loved a good party. So in this key moment of disobeying her king, Esther throws a party, um, which is also an echo of his last disobedient wife. The fast-to-feast duality here, um, right? the, the flipping between um, fast and feasting, it mimics the blending of Jewish and Persian traditions that marks diaspora, that marks this text, which has a lot of Persian loan words that are mixed with the Hebrew. Um, but it also has narrative implications. In approaching the king this way, Esther is refusing to strictly obey either man. She's disobeying the king by appearing uninvited, but she also rejects the course of action instructed by Mordecai, her uncle, cousin, unclear. She doesn't go to the king immediately, right? He tells her to go to the king and ask him to spare the Jews. She doesn't, she fasts first. And then when she does go to the king, she doesn't immediately ask him for the salvation of the Jews. She makes her defiance of her husband and the king completely her own. It's not Mordecai's defiance, it's hers. Yeah. So as a reader, when Esther chooses a three-day feast for herself, her household, and the Jews of the capital city. What do you think should happen next in the story? There's great precedent in Israel's history for God to strike down Haman and the king, you know, a couple of well-placed lightning bolts. Maybe the Greeks should invade and uh, 
you know, distract the king from his uh, other issues. Uh, maybe you expect an earthquake or a storm or something to happen. Maybe a few of those Egyptian plagues should come back again, turn the water to blood or something. You expect something really powerful to happen right now. And absolutely nothing does. Yeah, so instead of action, we get a kind of narrative frustration. Instead of speeding up at this, what you would expect to be a climactic moment, the story actually slows down. Esther learns of the genocide, but instead of acting, she fasts. When she finally goes before the king, instead of making a you know, dramatic speech to save the Jews, she invites him to dinner. And then at dinner, she invites him to dinner again. And so the dramatic moment keeps getting delayed. It keeps getting pushed further forward into the future, um, which is a fascinating and slightly baffling writing choice. <laughs> And so while this delay is in process, there's a whole little subplot thing going on with Haman and Mordecai that's raising tension differently. All of this tension comes to a head at the second banquet when Esther flat out accuses Haman. The king finally catches up with the story. Haman is killed in the way that he wanted to kill Mordecai. A little poetic justice or something there. Well, when the appointed day of the genocide arrives, the Jews fight back with permission from the king and soundly defeat their attackers. We don't know why the story writer didn't mention God here. Isn't this sort of the place in the story? We as Christians would expect the salvation of the Jews as it had always been in the past, time after time after time, wouldn't we have expected it to be attributed to divine intervention? And yet the author of the story of Esther simply doesn't do so. As easy as it would have been, half a phrase, two or three words slipped in right there. God saved them again. But those words aren't there, are they? The absence is so conspicuous that it, it almost feels like it had to be intentional. <laughs> um, but while there's not really a good way for us to know why the choice was made, we can speculate about it forever. Uh, but there's no way to know why the author made that decision. Um, but we can look at what it means as a result, I guess, for the story. Uh, so one result of it is that Esther's decision to disobey the king and Mordecai remains entirely her own. She, she wasn't <laughs> commanded by God. She didn't have a dream. Right. Yeah. Esther made the human choice. Yeah, and so her bravery and arguably her brilliance in saving her people are not directly attributed to a divine power or any external source at all. She does the right thing apparently, simply because it's the right thing to do. Her disobedience is, in that respect, it's disobedience, right? There's no way around it. You can't refigure it. You can't recast it as obedience to someone else. You can't recast it, although many people have tried, as obedience to Mordecai. She very much doesn't do what he says. And you can try to recast it as obedience to God, but because he's not mentioned in the text, you are inserting something external. You are making a very clear decision to take an autonomous decision away from a character. Um, in light of this, it seems to me that what Esther's modeling here, and potentially modeling for us, is a kind of righteous disobedience um, that is still a godly disobedience that does not necessarily wait for explicit instruction. Wow. So a few minutes ago, we asked the question, is Esther a role model for the 21st century woman? We propose to leave you today with the answer, yes, the entire story model. We also propose that Esther, in her entire story, is a model for the 21st century man. So Esther's growth over the course of the story, her narrative arc, from passivity to activity, right, from innocence and arguably naivete to responsibility 
um, and from obedience to righteous disobedience is also a blueprint we're proposing for spiritual development. And so as we travel along our personal spiritual journeys, many years later, <laughs> after this text was written, um, and as we learn and grow in God, we should aim to apply the lessons from the story of Esther, which is to face difficult and sometimes even impossible dilemmas with seriousness and courage and with an unwavering commitment to what is right. And so now it's time to sing together. Naomi, could you lead us in our closing song?